life, let alone the life of a child, clearly cannabis would be called for there because that'll stop the nausea. She, she's having so much vomiting in part because she's not making enough cannabis. Right. You know, so in that case, it's exactly what you need. On the other hand, you know, too much you wouldn't get pregnant in the first place. Right. Yeah, I guess everything is balanced. Male point of view as well. You know, because the maturation of the sperm is all regulated by cannabinoids as well, as is their movement. Wow. And the the uh, actual fertilization process itself. It's it's so simple once you understand the kinds of things that I try to explain to people. Because, for example, we know that uh, – hopefully you're recording some of this. Later. I am now, yeah. I started recording, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to go and do an introduction afterwards, but that's all right. <laughs> yeah, big deal, right? Yeah. Um, where was I going with this? Yeah, so one of the things that we know is that um, – are you familiar with mitochondrial inheritance? You know how oh, yes. the, you can trace the lineage of a person back via the mitochondrial DNA. Of their mothers. However, right? that only traces back your maternal lineage. Right, okay. So right. what happens when embryogenesis uh, develops this sperm-egg combination, the zygote, into you, uh, you, you know, you lose the maternal that the paternal, the father's mitochondria are lost. Well, there's a real easy way to understand what's going on there. You see, because flowing energy, in order to have energy, you got to make it, right? And, and everything is a balance of opposing forces. So we do things that make free radicals, and then we have to do things that suppress them, like I just described, for example, in terms of uh, the phys on a physiological level with with uh, implantation and, and pregnancy. But, but in terms of, for example, the sperm moving around, uh, it's going to, in order to do things in general in our bodies, we have to activate mitochondrial energy production mm -hmm. because that's how we make energy efficiently by burning carbohydrates via what's called the electron transport system. It's a very sophisticated molecular machine that passes energy from basically our foods ultimately to ATP, which is the common currency uh, of energy in a cell. And um, when it does that, it makes free radicals. And part of how we prevent that damage is that we shut down free radical production. And we do that by turning off carbohydrate burning and turning on fat burning which is actually a recycling process okay. where okay. We, we don't recycle randomly. What we do is we recycle damaged pieces. Well, you know, what are the pieces of your cells, your RNA, your DNA, your proteins, your carbohydrates, all flowing in this psychedelic Oaxaca-like hallucination, right, of fluidity. And um, in the process, when we make too many free radicals, they label those components by causing chemical changes. And central to my way of looking at things is that our biochemical complexity is designed to allow us to survive by inhibiting the cell death that would occur from free radicals. Wow. And I'll expand on that uh, in a little while. Okay. So it's a very story do the mitochondria only burn carbohydrates do they also burn fats no they burn fats and carbohydrates okay. and proteins we can have in general three sources and protein okay yeah but they they are typically converted into common denominators that can be used so uh, the protein degradation occurs outside of the mitochondria but common denominators are brought in and used for energy uh, so the, the the key here is we can make energy efficiently which is what we need to do if we're going to do things, you know, your muscles, your, your uh, nerve transmission, you know, your heartbeats, the production of insulin. All of those things require efficient energy production. So the differentiated state that characterizes the progression of evolution utilizes that high efficient energy production, which happens also to be very dangerous. Right. That's the case here, because when you make energy efficiently, any screw up makes free radicals. 
And those free radicals are the source of aging and all age-related illnesses. <laughs> right. So what you want, which is why antioxidants are good for you. But but what's critical and what we've been screwed by is the uh, basically the greed factor that has publicized throughout the world, but in particular in the United States, that we should eat fat-free diets, mm -hmm. which means you're only burning carbohydrates which means you're making free radicals, you're making aging, you're making Alzheimer's, you're making heart disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. Whereas if you're eating fat and that becomes a dominant source of your uh, energy, then you use different pathways that are not as dangerous because they're more focused on recycling. Right. And one of the key concepts uh, <laughs> is that we're one big fractal, but we're we're not a fractal in the sense. You familiar with fractals? Yes. Yeah. You know, so you know that if you magnify a fractal, you see the same thing. Correct. And you magnify yes. it again, and you see the same thing. You can go on and do that forever in either direction, right. but it doesn't change. Okay. So imagine that each time you did the magnification or the contraction, the algorithm changed as a function of how whatever was happening. It was interacting with the environment and therefore changing the environment. So what I'm saying is as time goes by, there's a dialogue between living systems and their environment and they support one another. You okay. know, we're so human centric. We don't understand that life only occurs because of what we, we can basically suck life out of our environment. That's what's going on. You know, look, look at the planet Earth. Sunlight hits the planet. And that is typically high in frequency, uh, ultraviolet light, rich spectrum in ultraviolet light. And ultraviolet light has high frequencies, which means more information potential, just like a computer, right? Okay. A slow chip can't do as much as a fast chip, right? And what we do is we extract that potential, that negative entropy, out of the sunlight, and we use that to create chemical organization on the planet. Wow. And chemical organization... As, as in addition to the uh, the heat of the earth, which is another energy source, in prebiotic times, they generated chemical organization, m meaning these flow-dependent structures. And that's a critical concept, that, that certain structures only exist by virtue of flow. And the reason it's critical, because that's what we are. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, you cork, you cork us up or you stop feeding us. <laughs> We go back to equilibrium. So we are far from equilibrium structures maintained at a distance from equilibrium, recharged with life by virtue of, you know, constantly taking in negative entropy <laughs> and putting out waste. We have to put out more waste in order to generate the organization. You see, it's, it's a balancing act there. So negative entropy, I guess, could be defined as organization. So yeah, exactly. structured branch chain amino acids or essential fatty acids, that kind of thing. Well, let's look at it more. Rather, you're, what you're doing is you're presenting a static perspective. Okay. And okay. that's how we teach people. Unfortunately, that's not what life is. We're the opposite. Right. So we basically create a scientific perspective, a medical perspective, a pharmacological perspective, a financial perspective. Well, not the financial world is, is moving beyond that. But, but where we look at things from a static point of view. And the problem with that is that has nothing to do with reality. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's another big problem, you know, <laughs> because the, the physics behind that perspective basically tells you that life cannot exist. And then uh, the brilliant work of Dr. Ilya Prigogine, who got his PhD the year I was born, 1947, and created a new, a new field of physics hmm. called Far From Equilibrium Thermodynamics. And it's minimally taught. Uh, it's, it, it's sad because the concepts are very teachable at, at a young age. Yeah, and but, I'd never heard of it before I read your paper. And even though I was looking into... Uh, entropy and negative entropy and all these things on my own. So you're right, it is very, very seldom taught. Yeah, well, it's retarded because that physics says life must exist. Right, right. So here we're teaching everybody and we never get beyond it. I mean, see, there's a reason why equilibrium physics is taught. It's easier to mathematically define. And for the past few hundred years, 
the math and the concepts have evolved into this very nice intellectual package. Uh, that's very functional within what it does, but it can't talk to life. And that's right. the problem. Okay. So Prigogine's work says life must exist. And it describes how flowing energy organizes matter. Hmm. And when you had no life on the planet and you had chemistry happening by virtue of the sunlight and the heat and you had the oceans and you had a lot of calcium that would go in and out of the solution as a function of the acidity of the oceans, which could have changed in local areas as the chemistry changed, right? Mm -hmm. You know, from, from the reactions that were occurring. And what happened was that led to prebiotic inorganic complexity on in the, the bios with the non biosphere it wasn't a biosphere at that time. There was no biology. So any organic like compounds that form, meaning carbon compounds of higher chain links, etc., they were all formed inorganically. So right. in the prebiotic soup, we could have organic compounds, but without life. So okay. just to, to get a better understanding of this, in the same way when you see those YouTube videos of them putting sand on a speaker and it naturally forms uh, very complex patterns, you're yes. saying this is the same way that uh, these inorganic pre-life compounds could have formed uh, through other chemical reactions or even sound, whatever. But Yeah, that's an example. I'll give you, I'll, I'll, let, I'll diverge a second and okay. I can show you them because you can see me, right? Yes. I can, see, I can do my share, screen sharing. Yes. And I can bring up things. So I, I, I'll do that in, in a second. Okay. Uh, so um, where was I? Lost in space. Um, yes. Yeah, so in this prebiotic soup, you could start to evolve the compounds, the chemicals that would later be critical for life. And often these things could, well, see, whenever you have, a source of something, negative entropy, chemical potential, okay, and a sink where it could flow to, meaning you could take negative entropy and make entropy, <laughs> or you could take chemical bonds and do things with them, okay? So flow organizes matter, and that's what Prigogine got his Nobel Prize for, 1977, what's called dissipative structures, Dissipate, they dissipate negative entropy. They dissipate potential. They make entropy increase, all right? But they themselves are organized structures. So what that's saying is you can form organized structures that are dependent on energy flowing through them. Hmm. And that's what happened in, in, in that prebiotic soup. We developed a complexity of flow-dependent prebiotic chemistry. And the chemistry developed the complexity that in order for energy to continue to be dissipated in a successful evolving rate of what was called a far from equilibrium phase change had to occur. So okay. we're okay. all familiar with equilibrium phase changes. For example, we know that if the temperature is above 100 degrees, water is steam. At, at a particular pressure, because pressure right. comes into play as well, right? And we know that if we cool it down, we're going to have ice. So we're, we're going from lack of movement to a greater level of movement in a liquid to an even greater level of freedom in a gas, all right? But once you're at that temperature, that state is stable. You know, ice doesn't change as long as it's cold. You know, and steam is floating around randomly moving molecules as long as it's hot enough, right? Right. So these are equal. When you make ice, you're making cri ice crystals, right? You're oh, yeah. making organized structures wow. that are static. You know, they don't change with time. As long as there's no energy flowing through them, they're going to just stay as that structure. Mm -hmm. And Things, you know, in our world are loaded, you know, everywhere around us. You look around you, behind you, your wall, your table, your clothing. All of these are equilibrium structures. As long as you don't change their chemistry, they stay as they are. You know, the table in front of you will sit there forever 
as long as it doesn't burn up and undergo other chemical reactions and rock. Yeah. Yeah. So those are stable equilibrium structures. But now let's look at non far from equilibrium structures, non equilibrium structures. Look at what happens when you take a bath and you pull the plug. Eventually it forms a whirlpool. So mm -hmm. here you're seeing gravity inducing a flow dependent structures that allows the water to pass quicker and therefore dissipate the potential more rapidly. Because, you know, you can have a little whirlwind in there, right? A little wind, a water wheel meal making electricity as your water drained. But once it's drained, it's done. Right. Right? So <laughs> those are all, you know, equilibrium, uh, far from equilibrium phenomena forming that whirlpool. And the same is true of a, a tornado or a hurricane. You know, on, right. uh, on Jupiter, there's a, the spot on Jupiter. That's a, that's a, a storm, a flow-dependent storm, like a hurricane that's been there for hundreds of years. So they can be quite stable, okay? Right. So those examples of physical flow-dependent structures caused by temperature and pressure changes. But there are other ones that occur as a function of chemical reactions. All right. So you can have in a liquid... Instead, you know, we, we naturally assume that the molecules in a liquid are all random because they are. You know, you take a glass of water and those molecules are randomly moving around. Right. But that's not what's happening in you. They're not randomly moving around. They're organized. And you can create a chemical reaction in that too, you know, in, in your glass of water that will create organized patterns in that glass so that rather than the molecules of the liquid being randomly distributed, they become organized because in doing so, they can generate more entropy to their surroundings. Hmm. So the simple rule in very simple words is a collection of molecules will organize itself spontaneously as long as by doing so, it makes the universe, its environment, stupider, quicker. So molecules will get smarter as long as they can make something else stupider. Right. And by stupider, you mean less organized, correct? Less organized, yeah. Right. Let more entropic. Right. Exactly. Okay. So let's look at what's happening on the planet. We have sunlight coming on that's high in frequency. Lots of information potential. Uh, high energy photons are what the high frequencies of light are. And the slower frequencies have less energy in them, all right? So we are irradiating the planet with all of the sunlight with a spectrum high in ultraviolet light, which is high energy and therefore high information potential. And we re-irradiate back into the solar system infrared, which is now a lower frequency. So what does that tell you? It tells you we stole information out of the sunlight, <laughs> Right. That's how we power our life. Okay. That's why we're here, because we were able to form flow-dependent structures initially in that prebiotic soup that got complex enough as a result of what was flowing through it that a new solution was needed so that the flow could keep flowing, <laughs> and oh. that was the emergence of life. It's really well, easy, it's, right? Yeah, but it's in so interesting. Yeah. It's the kind of stuff so, you never hear, but yeah, it makes total no, sense. No, because I'm the only one who says it. Nobody <laughs> knows this. Right. Well. I'm giving you the secrets of life, and I tried for so long to communicate that into the scientific world, and I just finally said, fuck them. You know, <laughs> They live in a box that's been created by the wrong reasons. Right. The box has not been created you know, because of intelligence and the desire to maintain health and cooperativity, blah, blah, blah. It's been motivated by money. Right. So when we have a box that defines our health system and how we, you know, treat people and what people are, and we've created a whole reality that's wrong, <laughs> that has nothing to do with reality. Hmm. That's the situation we're currently in. We have doctors who don't understand what I'm telling you. Right. And they have no interest in learning what I'm telling you because they're succeeded and they have their prestige and they're making their money. I must be crazy. <laughs> right. Yeah. They're obviously right. Yeah. See? 
And so well, let's carry this this logic further that I, that I was developing. So you now see how we had a far from equilibrium phase change creating life. And right. what you have to do is keep in mind that the planet is one big chemistry set. And so once can I interrupt you just just to clarify in my own mind and hopefully for anyone uh, listening? Sure, no, watching. that's why questions are good. Always interrupt. Me. So the phase change is, is as drastic as water going from liquid to gas uh, in a non-equilibrium phase change. That's as as drastic as going from non-living structure to living structure. Is what you're yes, saying? Yes. Okay. Exactly. One is flow dependent and mandated by the intellectual foundation of far from equilibrium physics. Wow. The other says life is impossible. And that's what we teach people. Right. Wow. <laughs> Oops. Yeah. <laughs> and why? Because the teachers don't know far from equilibrium thermodynamics because they weren't taught it. Right. And that's exactly the parallel situation that we have with life and with cannabis and with the endocannabinoid system right. because they don't – this is what's so magical and incredible is that as life evolved, what is evolution? You know, it's this chemistry set on the planet getting more and more complicated. That's mm -hmm. what evolution is, right? And that – what you have to do is look at life, not at your life, okay? Don't look at it as you, this chemical entity <laughs> that's independent of your surroundings. What you are is a product of your surroundings. You are constantly taking in energy and information Those are the, and mass. Those are the only things there are, right? In, energy and mass, right? Mm -hmm. So your nervous system is what monitors all the information, all the energy. And your immune system is what monitors all the mass, the food that you eat, the insect that bites you. Anything that comes into your system is monitored by your immune system. And both of those systems are totally controlled and regulated by your endocannabinoid system, as is everything else in your body from conception to death. Yeah. So what's going on here and how does it relate to this physics that I'm talking about? Well, and what I'm going to tell you again, even though the information is all there, it's not assembled by the scientific or medical community. All right. So <laughs> what your cannabinoid system is doing is this regulating energy flow. We all know that activate your CB1 receptor, get stoned, and what are you going to get? Munchies. Mm-hmm. Well, that's input into the system. Right. That's necessary input to give you the energy wow. to be alive. So right there, that's telling you something pretty significant. <laughs> yeah, so that's just a fractal scale up from what they do on a molecular level, like in our neurons. The exactly. endocannabinoids go back and, and control the flow of because, neurotransmitters. Because you see, the evolution of life has been the evolution of complexity. And don't look at yourself as an individual entity independent of your environment. What, you have to, what we have to start to train ourselves to do is look at ourselves as quantized collections of human biochemistry. In other words, the chemistry set of human life appears in these individual entities, but it's really part of a much bigger flow-dependent chemistry set. All right. All right. So there's human biochemistry. There's insect biochemistry with the subdivisions of all the insects. All vertebrates have endocannabinoid CB1 receptors. So as evolution got more and more complicated, it needed to gain a new level of flexibility. Because, see, what, what is evolution selecting for? It's not selecting for strength. It's not selecting for intelligence. It's selecting for how you use strength and intelligence to adapt. It's about adaptability. Adaptability, right. Okay. And we had we meaning the primitive pre-vertebrate uh, living system that we are a part of. See, we are part of nothing more than one big 
evolving chemical reaction, a single chemical reaction that has generated all of these flow dependent structures. You see, it's, it, 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 the, the chemical reaction keeps evolving in complexity. And that complexity generated life. And now what I'm saying is that evolution of new species is simply the chemistry set getting to a higher level and demanding new layers of complexity. So we now have a far from equilibrium phase change and we create new species. Hmm. Well, with more adaptability in a more complex environment. You see, we change the environment and then we have to change ourselves to adapt to the changed environment. And the environment's doing the same thing. Right. Yeah. It's changing us and it's adapting to us. We're, we're the opposite sides of this living phenomena, <laughs> the big chemistry set that we're a part of. Right. It's, <laughs> it's pretty crazy. It's wild, right. Yeah. <laughs> But you see, all of this phenomena that we're discussing happens because there's a fundamental property of flowing energy, and that is it selects for cooperation, molecular cooperativity. When you see organized structures in a liquid, molecules, even though they don't have brains, have a natural quality of cooperativity. Hmm. Because once you select for that, that's what keeps that resonance going. Life keeps evolving as long as you have life, right? Right. The problem is now is that life has evolved <laughs> to the point where it can destroy itself. Mm -hmm. So we can no longer be as ignorant about the processes that I'm describing. We have to now embrace that reality and understand that the illusions of self, of country and nation, are not important. What's important is the sustainability of the evolving chemistry set. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which includes the whole planet and everything on it. The whole planet, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and which is, in terms of vertebrates, which are the evolutionarily more advanced entities, right, mm -hmm. as those vertebrates keep increasing in their complexity. The human brain is the high point of evolutionary complexity. And that human brain has more cannabinoid activity than any other neurotransmitter activity in the human brain. It's the most important thing. Right. Why? The G-coupled uh, protein receptors, they're the most abundant in the brain. Is that correct? Well, the whole biochemical flow-dependent system called the endocannabinoid system which is composed of various receptors and compounds that bind to them. But again, all of that is in these, you know, th think of, you know, thousands and thousands of little tor chemical tornadoes, you know, or, or like a psychedelic experience when you're, when you're watching visual hallucinations, abstract visual hallucinations, where you have all these patterns and they're all in symbiosis with one another. They fluidly change in harmony with one another. Hmm. That's, what, that's how life is. It's that harmonious chemical interaction, talking with everything else in this unfolding complexity of the biosphere. Wow. Well, <laughs> all right? <laughs> that's pretty deep. I can see I've blown your mind. <laughs> I have a tendency of doing that. Yeah. Because it's simple enough that you can hear what I'm saying, and yet the concepts are so radically different than what we understand. Yeah. I mean, this is blowing my mind for years as I keep finding out more and more of this path that I'm on. Right. You know, it has nothing to do with me. I'm just a chemical entity, you right. know, absorbing in negative entropy from my surroundings and assembling it into novel forms. Because that's what life is, you see? Right. There's no ego, there's no I, me, me, ma. No, we're just chemical, quantized chemical entities that the chemistry set has selected for to allow us to probe the unfolding of time so we can adapt. And those of us who adapt continue the biochemistry of life. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And most life has gone extinct. So now we have this unique capacity of self-reflection and intelligence that has evolved and now we've got to be smart enough to use it and to understand 
what we are. And that's that's all I'm trying to do for myself. You see, <laughs> I, I, I've been interested my whole life in understanding what is life. Mm-hmm. So the things that I'm telling you are my solutions to that question. You know, when I first started graduate school, I took a course on thermodynamics, thermo energy, heat, dynamics, flow, right? Because I wanted to understand what was making molecular biology. You know, when when I was uh, just at that time, that's when they first discovered the genetic code. Oh, wow. So we knew the relationships. You know, because I'm 69 years old. I'm an old fart. Wow. You know? Um, but that's when they discovered the relationship between what's now known as, you know, the holy trinity of DNA, RNA, and protein synthesis. So we had a foundation to understand that there was a common chemical denominator to life. So my question then was, how did that happen? Where did it come from? What's going on? So I figured, I'll take a course in, you know, thermodynamics and I'll learn about energy flow and then I'll understand how life came about. Well, unfortunately, aside from, of course, tormenting me because I'm a mathematical moron (laughs) and actually physical chemistry is very simple if you know math. If you don't know math, it's like a nightmare. Um, And and I'm I'm naturally an idiot when it comes to math, but I'm very stubborn and I wanted to learn this stuff. And eventually I osmosed things. (laughs) Because I discovered the work of Prigogine. Right. Because the physics course that I took basically said life can't exist. So I said, well, this is not the right answer. I'm here. And and, and I do believe in science. Right. You know, it makes right. sense to me, things. So why would there not be a, an answer here that we haven't figured out? And that's what Prigogine had been working on his whole career. You know, because what he did, again, was create this field of far from equilibrium thermodynamics. When he first wanted to go down that intellectual avenue, because it had not been pursued, his fellow, you know, teachers and and, and instructors, why would you do that? (laughs) You see, because they had this nice mathematical package. Right. Nice closed little box that was all efficient and real in that box. But life was outside of that box. (laughs) Right. Yeah. You know. So he created this field, and I watched the evolution of his thinking. So in 19, I think it was 84, he published a book. And just the titles of his book capture so much once you're on start to understand what's going on here. The title of that book was called From Being to Becoming. See, Hmm. being is static. Becoming is a process of change. Right. And it's a mathematically intense book, w- way beyond me, but I must have read it a hundred times and looked up a hundred other books to start to get some understanding, you know. <laughs> but he hadn't, he hadn't yet gone, aha, in right. his own mind to the nth degree of embracing what he created. And that happened in 1998 with the last book that he wrote called The End of Certainty. Okay. (laughs) Nice. All right. The End of Certainty. It's certain, though, you know. Yeah. But but in fact, it's a spectacular book. It's it's only about that thick. Okay. But it's so intense, you know, that you, you have to read it many, many times to start to understand it. And, you know, this guy was so incredibly brilliant. He kills me, you know, he says, oh, this book is designed for the average reader, blah, 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 <laughs> except for chapters so-and-so and so-and-so. You could, could admit those. Those would be more for, you know, an advanced physics course. Well, go read the preface of his book. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> and the preface has more information than any book that you've read. <laughs> It's like you got, you know, like you're sitting here listening to the stuff that I'm saying. Yeah. All I've done is extend his work into biology and life. Well, you no. Know? So that's you the read, end, end of certainty. Like, yeah, because it's a what we are involved in is this continuous creation of new. That's right. what evolution is. Time is an unfolding of these chemical processes. And on the planet Earth, you know, conditions were such that we created this chemistry set that just continues on and on. Just the way that spot is on the uh, on the planet Jupiter. Well, here we have chemical complexity existing in this, you know, evolving pseudo stable situation. Right. And 
the magic of that enhanced variability and adaptability that occurred with the emergence of vertebrates coincided with the emergence of the CB1 receptor. Wow. So it's my contention. And, and I'm an extremely conservative scientist, all right? When I say things, I can back them up because right. otherwise I wouldn't say them to myself. You know what <laughs> right, I mean? yeah. The stuff that I talk about is what emerges as far from equilibrium changes in my brain because I feed in all of this information and then all of a sudden you go, aha, uh -huh. see that's a phase change. A far from equilibrium phase change, you've created new flow patterns, hmm. you see. It's part of this whole evolutionary process, right? So anyway, it turns out that that CB1 receptor regulates in particular, among other things, calcium channels. Why is that important? Because in the prebiotic soup, calcium wound up being, because I think it's the most abundant element on the planet, if I'm not mistaken. Is it most abundant? I thought carbon was... Carbon, yeah, carbon was the most abundant mineral, maybe. I think it's the most abundant mineral. Let's see. Although iron, you would think, would be. Anyway, it's, it's significant, all right? Right, yeah. The point is that calcium, by virtue of reactions that occurred in that prebiotic soup, became critical to the evolving prebiotic complexity and hence to the evolving biochemical complexity. So what is the truth is that anytime any activity, any kind of differentiated activity occurs in your body or anybody else's, calcium triggers it. So if you're looking at nerve transmission, calcium triggers it. Muscle contraction, right. hormone production, insulin release, everything is always triggered by calcium. And energy, I think I've mentioned, can be made either efficiently by burning carbohydrates dangerously because of free radical production or inefficiently burning fat. And when it burns fat, a process known as autophagy occurs. Mm -hmm. Auto eating, autophagy, self eating. Okay. Okay. And that's exactly what you do. Our cells eat themselves, but they don't eat themselves randomly. They eat the labeled chemicals that were modified by free radicals. See, because once you modify a chemical, let's say a base in your DNA, all right? Mm -hmm. If you change that base, it may no longer code for the same thing in making an amino, making a protein. Right, because it's damaged. Now, yeah, yeah well, because it's been chemically altered. Right, okay? damaged from our perspective, yeah. So the complexity of life, in my perspective, <clears throat> been designed through selective processes, not an intelligent designer, <laughs> has been designed dynamically in order to make more and more complexity in order to survive the free radicals that are making as you make more and more complexity. So it's another one of these, you know, back and forth dialogues that we keep seeing here. Okay. So what happens is <laughs> we have that biochemic, biochemical complexity is designed to monitor free radical damages because then it knows that it's making too many or, or not enough. Because on the one hand, we need the free radicals to be produced because that's when we're making energy efficiently, right? right. So that's what allows the support of our brain, for example. And, which is actually a very critical point where I want to go, so I'm going to jump there right now before I forget again. Okay. <laughs> actually, before I go to the brain, I'm going to go back one more step to the very foundation here. A single free radical molecule, one molecule, can kill you. Wow, Think really? about that. Yeah. That's like saying one photon of sunlight can kill you. One free radical molecule that you're generating all the time by burning food can kill you. Let me give you now, blow your mind further here. You are composed of about, you know, 15 trillion cells that are of your cells. And then you, of course, you're loaded with an equal number of microbes. <laughs> right. They, they're part of you. Um, in, in any event, 
every single one of those cells can every day receives about 20,000 of the damages, free radical damages, where one in one cell can kill you. How can that be? Well, let's say the one cell hits the base in the critical gene that involves cell division and modifies it so it now is no longer controlled. Now you have a cancer cell. Hmm. So what that showed, first of all, your first line of defense or antioxidants were not able to quench that free radical. And then other modifications that your biochemistry does did not prevent that free radical from being made. Hmm. And then your DNA repair systems did not see the damage that was made and didn't fix it. And then it became part of you and became a cancer cell that your immune system didn't see. And then you go to the doctor and they chemo you and that <laughs> doesn't do it. And then you die. One molecule killed you from one cell and you've got 15 trillion getting 20,000 damages every day. Wow. So that's why I say the complexity of life is designed to modulate free radicals. Okay. Because when we make, they're telling, if we make too many, they say you're out of balance, start to change, fix things, change your biochemical circuitry, take new roads. When you're going from this side of town to the other side, diversify. All right, find something safe. Mm -hmm. All right. So your CB1 receptor by regulating calcium channels regulates activity. But in the sugar burning efficient mode, <coughs> your brain is 5% of your body weight and it uses 20% of your energy. All right. Your head is hot. You're always giving off heat. And you're doing that despite the fact that you're making energy as efficiently as you can. Hmm. So what that's telling you is that efficient energy production is critical for the human brain. And what I'm saying, therefore, is that the cannabinoid system, in particular the CB1 receptor, is what has allowed for the evolution of your brain. You know, this is total radical stuff, but I'm, well, I, I, again, I can show you why. It's very simple. You couldn't develop the complexity of your brain without having a very efficient way to fine tune the efficient energy production that is dangerous. You say, because it's dangerous, if you don't fine tune it, you die. Your cells die. Okay? Right. So, with the advent of vertebrates, you had a way of fine-tuning energy production everywhere that it was needed, which is everywhere. Your immune system, digestive system, cardiovascular system. So every system in your body is regulated by the pot that your body makes. <laughs> and because of that, by consuming more pot, you can affect your entire biochemistry in a way that's consistent with what nature has selected for, because we've selected for always increased cannabinoid activity. If you look at the brain of a vertebrate, as it evolves up to the point that we had, you know, the, the uh, mammalian brain, and a primate brain, and then the human brain, and then the evolution of the human brain, what you see always is that in the more evolutionarily advanced areas of your brain and the areas that control your emotions and the areas that control your memories, always cannabinoid activity regulating it and in increasing with evolution. Wow. So is that a, um, a definable uh, progression of an increase in cannabinoid receptors in various life forms? So are, are there more uh, per centimeter in the brain of a human than in the brain of a rat, for instance? Yes, and, and in the, well, look at, see, our brain, we have areas that they don't have, evolutionary right. advanced areas, and there's always more cannabinoid receptors in those areas. Right. And I'm telling you why, because you can't exist, the cell can't exist in that differentiated state, doing its neurotransmission without killing itself, if it didn't have a CB1 receptor. And we have proof of this. You know why? 
If you make a knockout mouse, which we can do now, you can eliminate a gene in a mouse, right? Right. So you eliminate the CB1 receptor. Now you have what the governments of the world want, a mouse that can't get high. They want us to be like that. Well, what are the consequences of it? The mice die prematurely, significantly prematurely, whereas all the other mice are still alive. These guys are dying. <laughs> and how do they exist? They sit there shivering all the time because they're so fearful because they don't make <laughs> enough pot to be mellow and relaxed <laughs> that they don't, you know, they're just freaked out and they die young. Wow. And I, well, I read it. Uh, government wants us to be. Right. That crimes against humanity. They want to deprive us of a necessary nutrient that evolution has been selecting as a key component for the evolution of humanity. And we now have gotten smart enough to understand that that's what's going on. And now we can actually enhance evolution by using cannabis because then we will be like the future man. <laughs> and now that brings to another very revolutionary thought here. That, that, that is just really quite crazy here. <coughs> I need to brace myself so, for this. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we've still only talked about the CB1 receptor, and we'll right. stay there. We'll stay there for a little while longer. Okay. So, what I'm saying is that's allowed for the evolution of the human brain, because that's why we're hot. Okay, our head is hot all the time because we're using that efficient mode, okay. and because of that, we're we're very easily damaged. Your your brain, as I said, uses you know, 20% of your energy, even though it only weighs 5%. And it's doing that in that efficient mode. Right. Now, whenever you put any impediments in the efficient flow of electrons that are generating energy in the brain or anywhere else, that's when they generate the free radicals, and that's when they cause inflammation. And we all know how susceptible the head is to inflammation, head injury, right? Mm -hmm. Post-traumatic stress disorder, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm actually not going where I started to, so remind me to go back to metabolism. Okay. Um, <laughs> now I forgot where I just was. <laughs> About uh, inflammation in the brain. Yes, inflammation. So when you're efficiently making energy, you know, you're calming down that free radical production, but as soon as you get any kinks in the pathway and you start spitting out free radicals, now you generate inflammation because that's what's happening. And that's why the head injury is so damaging. Right. In contrast, your heart gets most of its energy by burning fat okay. because that's safe because then you're recycling. Instead of going down and making every little piece of your appropriate biochemical, you make components. You use components that you recycled. See, so now it's much more efficient. You're not making as much. Because you're reusing pieces. And because... Sorry, ahead. can you explain that a bit more? What, what do you mean um, reusing? Well, so look, if you have to make a tire, mm -hmm. it's going to take a lot more energy than if you can take another tire and reuse it. Right, okay. You know? It's the same in your body. In order to make DNA, there are many steps involved. And if instead of starting in the beginning, you start towards the end, you haven't had to make it all again. You've recycled what you had and are using the pieces. It's, it's a big junkyard. Okay? okay. Yeah. That's what happens with autophagy when you start to turn on fat burning. Okay, right. Okay? So your heart, you don't want your heart to age, and you have a choice. Whereas your brain, you don't have as much of a choice because it's so complex. All right? Think of the algorithm that would be required to describe your brain versus your heart. Your heart's a lot simpler. Right. right. So it doesn't need that efficient flow to do its job. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take that logic to. So your heart, about 60, 70 percent of its energy comes from burning fat. Wow. With in, the, in your brain, it's 95 percent carbohydrates. Wow. OK. I didn't know right. that. Yeah. <laughs> but now let's take that further. On a cellular level, the cell does both of those things as determined by how many damages it has. And so the first, as soon as you start to do something, you're going to make more free radicals. They're going to be quenched by antioxidants, you know, your vitamin C and your, your other antioxidants, 
Mm -hmm. Things like NAC and acetylcysteine. <coughs> so you're able to quench a certain amount of increased production. But if you go beyond that, then the signals start to change pathways. You know, the signal will alter an enzyme so that it turns on or turns off or turns on or turns off a gene. There's many ways of regulating, many, many layers of regulation, okay? So what you, the first line of defense is antioxidants. And then the next line of defense winds up making the mitochondria, which are your energy factories that have these electron transport systems. It makes the electron transport system a little sloppier in that it wastes some of its energy. Okay. But by doing that, it doesn't make as many free radicals. So there's a protein called UCP2, uncoupling protein 2, that's involved in uh, shuttling fats and, and protons back and forth in the, uh, in the mitochondria in a way that dissipates energy. It makes heat. But oh, that wow. way it's, making, it's not making uh, free radicals. All right. When the system said we don't want any more free radicals, go make some heat. All right. That's one of the solutions. <laughs> we have many solutions. One of the other things that the chemistry, self-aware chemistry could say is go make fat. Because if you're making fat out of your carbohydrates, you're not burning the carbohydrates. Hmm. Okay? All right. So there's this constant balance, this dynamic, flowing, self-adjusting balance between making free radicals, burning carbohydrates, burning fats, and going back and forth, even within the cell, in different areas. Wow. In order to maintain homeostasis, which according to me means make enough free radicals to do what you have to do, but don't make too many and damage yourself. Right. And I'm saying that on a cellular level, a tissue level, an organismic level, and a societal level. It's all the same process. So the next thing a cell can do after it does a little bit of uncoupling, if that's still not enough and you're still making too many free radicals, what it does is it turns off carbohydrate burning. And, well, let me back up. One of the next line, apparently, temporarily, here, but is you turn on a process called aerobic glycolysis, which is you burn sugar, glucose, in the presence of oxygen, but instead of burning it and then feeding components into what's known as the Krebs cycle, the mill, it's kind of big, big metabolic mill of chemicals coming in and out. Instead, what it does is it turns glucose into lactic acid. Okay. Glucose, pyruvate, pyruvate to lactic acid. Normally, it feeds acetyl groups into that metabolic mill. So it's a diversion because that metabolic mill is what feeds the electron transport system. You see, so it's, you know, the feedback is saying we're making too many free radicals. Stop pumping carbohydrates into the electron transport system. Let's do some diversionary tactics. Wow. So the first diversionary tactic is to make lactic acid, which is inefficient, very inefficient. But it allows for glycolysis, which will make inefficient ATP, to continue. Hmm. By making that lactic And that's why... Uh, for example, cancer cells, acid environment, people are always talking about cancer cells and acid and they like sugar. They're, they don't like sugar. The cancer cell likes it, but your body doesn't like it. Right. <laughs> so they turn on that aerobic glycolysis, which is a fermentation process. They're making lactic acid. It's, you know, bacteria. Is that, sorry, is that also what happens like in distance runners when they... Yes. Okay. The muscles and start producing lactic acid. It's what happens when... Uh, when you're working out and pushing it too far? Well, anytime you make too many free radicals, you need to divert the flow. Wow. And yeast do that, for example, by making alcohol. That's, a, that's another fermentation process. Others make hydrogen gas. You know, there's just different ways of throwing energy out rather than burning it to protect yourself. And, of course, one way thing you can do with energy is to, is to actually synthesize a new cell okay all right so what i'm telling you then is there's many ways of diverting flow mm -hmm. in order to maintain safe levels of free radical production hmm. and burning fat is critical all right 
to doing that. So hundreds, you know, a hundred years ago, we died pre predominantly from infectious diseases, right. which we fight using largely our infl our um, kind of intelligent adapted arm of the immune system in conjunction with what's known as the uh, innate immune system, right? They, they, they work in dialogue. One is we're born with the other, we, edu we learn through our exposure, okay? And that immune system is very much regulated by the CB2 receptor. Okay, right. You know, everybody heard, yeah, it's the immune receptor. Well, so th that is, is a much too constipated look at what the CB2 receptor does, because guess what the CB2 receptor does? turns on fat burning. Okay, right. So now look at what we've got. We've got CB1 that can allow for efficient sugar burning so we can develop a brain. And we have CB2, which can help us whenever we're overloaded with free radical production, be it the brain or anywhere else in your body. You're going to make free radicals when you're going to make illness. When you make excess chronically, that's what illness is. Viral infections generate tremendous inflammation, bacterial infections, etc. So what you have to do is regulate energy flow again. Hmm. And viruses have ways of regulating energy flow so that the cell doesn't die, so it can keep making viruses. Right. Cancer cells have to deal with the same problem. All right? So most cancer cells start out because the cells were burning sugar and making too many free radicals and then their solution became cell division wow <laughs> right a cancer cell, all wow. right that's why cancer so can be so yeah. aggressive okay and they're using that those sugar burning pathways initially wow all right so now you treat with a high dose of cannabis really high doses and you turn on cb2 receptors throughout your whole body, you know, wherever it can happen and uh, other pathways as well, turn on fat burning. Now, the difference between fat burning and carbohydrate burning, one is a very com complicated, uh, evolutionarily advanced system associated with differentiated cells doing things, in other words, sugar burning. The other is a recycling program. And let's, to, to see really how simple this is, let's, jump to society. So here over the past few hundred years, we keep learning how to do more and more things. We use energy more efficiently. You know, at first we had fire and we could stay warm and cook with it. And now we control fire and make gasoline engines. All right. right. Or any of the other things in our society that allow for all of the things that are our society. But what do we do as we're doing that? Can we I make free we generate waste, right? right. And we are now at the point where we're generating so much waste that if we don't deal with our waste, we will poison ourselves. That's exactly what's going on in your cells. The waste that they generate is too many free radicals. Wow. And because you see, it's the same process. It's the evolutionary process that led to life, that led to evolution, that led to man, and then <laughs> led to man creating our own flow-dependent structures outside of us by manipulating the environment. All right, society, okay. Our financial systems are flow-dependent <laughs> structures. Yeah. That's why they're oscillating between boom and bust. Right. Right. <laughs> and it flows Every between banks like a river. Yeah, as soon as the, what you need in order to have a successful economy is you need flow. If everybody stops spending money, then the, the structure disappears. Mm -hmm. Just like when all the water drained out of the tank, you know, the right. whirlpool disappeared. So, how do cannabinoids? They don't actually act as antioxidants. They control they do the, that as well. But more importantly, is what you're suggesting. They control the production of free radicals. That's yes, pretty amazing. You're wise to see that because people are so focused on the antioxidantness, not understanding that there are two ways of being antioxidant. One is to quench a free radical, mm -hmm. and the other is to not make it. Wow. So they, but they also act as free radical uh, as antioxidants in the system. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, but that's not what's important. What's important right. is that they're regulating our energy flow and allowing us to have a brain and allowing us to survive and now allowing us to get smart enough to understand that the endocannabinoid system regulates everything <laughs> and that most cancers start out as sugar burners 
and then use the aerobic uh, glycolysis known as the Warburg effect in order to help them survive. And that once we start screwing with their metabolism, we can screw with them. So what your CB2 receptor does is it turns on fat burning. Now, when you have cells that have developed their complexity in their environment to survive, in a way that's totally dependent on sugar burning. Like cancer cells, right? Cancer cells, most cancer cells, not all, because right. you can have stem, I'll go into stem cells later. They're fat burners, okay? Okay. So what, ha so what, what happens is our chemotherapy and all of these therapies work within the sugar burning mode that the cancer cells are in. So, when you force high doses of cannabis onto a cancer cell and force it into fat burning mode, it will not most of the time or significantly times not have the ability to shift into the fat burning mode, Right. cause the cell to scramble its circuitry, undergo apoptosis and die. And that's how cannabis kills cancer. Wow. All right. But now if you pre-treat it with chemo or radiation, what you're doing is you're selecting for the, this is a whole rat, this is the radical thought that I was going to earlier, okay? okay. <laughs> um, so, let's say you have a million different cancer cells, and they're existing in all of these different patterns of metabolism, mm -hmm. okay? And, and, what I described to you earlier, the Warburg effect, right? Aerobic sugar burning when you don't need to burn it that way is because of generating too many free radicals. Now, there are times in a cell's normal existence that it doesn't want to make too many free radicals, in particular when it's replicating its DNA. Okay. Think of the insanity of DNA. Here we have a cell that's smaller than anything you can see. And inside of that cell, you have one yard of DNA. Wow. And, it's, and it's getting those 20,000 damages every day, right? So you want to minimize that because that's what everything is about. All right? So when the cell is replicating its DNA, it turns off the efficient electron transport-driven energy production and turns on aerobic glycolysis, the Warburg effect. Wow. So it's a normal part of our lives. All of these diverse pathways are used under different circumstances. And there's this constant oscillation and variability because we're constantly changing our environment just by walking, by turning your head. Anything is changing the cell's environment. <laughs> and we are constantly adapting to all of this in this big cosmic flow of this chemistry set called the biosphere. Wow. <laughs> So chemotherapy targets for the sugar-burning cancer cells? Yeah, so they find new ways of escaping. Look at it this way. You're on one side of the city. Think of a map, a mm -hmm. city map. And you got to get to the other side. And you got all these different roadways. Well, depending on what you're doing, what car you have, what the weather's like, you know, you take one road or another. You go into work, you want to get on the highway and zip right over there. Well, suppose the highway is blocked. You're going to take another path, right? Right. Well, that's what happens with chemo. All of those biochemical pathways are our differentiated pathways using our energy. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what we And you do chemo, you block one road. It's no big deal. You just go find a new road. That's right. why chemo works for the most, pe most people because they develop resistance. And there's pe peer-reviewed papers that show radiation and chemo promote drug resistance which is why people who use cannabis who have not yet done chemo are more likely to succeed with their cannabis than if they had done chemo or radiation. I was just in Prague at a big world's largest hemp conference, CannaFest, mm. and I met with a number of caregivers, people who advise others and help others, in particular with cancer. And these people have treated thousands of people and helped people, thousands of people. You know? Yeah. And I, they are all in different countries. 
They all do their own thing with their own strains, their own methods, blah, blah, blah. I asked all of them independently, what's your overall success rate, regardless of whether people had chemo or not? Just overall, what are you finding? And independently, each one of them said about 80%. Wow. You know how much better that is than the doctors? Isn't it like 2% or something with chemo? Yes, it's just crazy. Yeah. So, again, our governments are forcing us to age, forcing us to suffer needless diseases. And that's why I want to go to the world court, because they are guilty of crimes against humanity. Wow. It's that simple. You know, even that CB1 receptor that is the largest neurotransmitter in our brain, it's always turned on to a certain degree. So we can turn it on more or we can turn it off more. And some people will naturally have it on more and some people will have it off more, which takes me back. I forgot I didn't finish the, the uh, important statement. Okay. So here we have a million different cells existing in all of these different metabolic states. You know, some are replicating their DNA and are sugar burning via glycolysis, aerobic glycolysis. And now we come and we hit them with chemo. Mm -hmm. That's going to kill whatever cells it can kill, but not kill whatever cells it can't kill. All right. So depending on which road they are on to go across town, they're either going to die or they're going to get to the other side of town. Hmm. Right. <laughs> wow. So. What's going on here is the following. The ones that get to the other side of town have a metabolic state that allows them to survive the insult of whatever therapy is being applied. They will continue to divide. When you turn on fat burning, for example, there are changes in genetic architecture. Genes can either be exposed so they can be expressed. Because remember, it's one yard worth of DNA, right? All right. You know, in, in like in an extreme visualization, not a realistic visualization, but imagine you have a ball of yarn and the gene that you're looking for to be expressed, if it's on the outside or in the center of the ball, it's going to be different. All right. Yeah. All right. So by wrapping and unwrapping that ball as a function of need, which is what is happens. All right. You create different architectures. So when a cell is in that sugar burning mode, it's got a particular architecture. It's what we call epigenetics. Okay, right. The sequence of the DNA is not modified, but the structure of it is. So think of a ladder. We're not talking about changing the rungs in the ladder. We're changing the shape right. of the Right, unfolding, unfolding. Okay. Yeah, you know, we can add a piece here or take away a piece here. You know, We can do different things that change the accessibility of the DNA. All right? So what I'm suggesting, and this is extremely radical, is that the genes that are being expressed under any particular stressed circumstance will then become targets of mutagenesis because you're making all of these extra free radicals and you're having stalled replication forks because of damages on you or stalled transcription forks where you're expressing your genes. Now, when you have a stalled RNA polymerase, that actually promotes strand breaks. And DNA damages, which now will promote the ability to have genetic changes. So what I'm saying, and this is what's radical, we go from metabolism to epigenetics to genetics. In other words, we respond to our environment not only with our metabolism that then gets institutionalized to a, in a dynamic sense with epigenetics. But we know that epigenetics are actually transferred between generations of cells. Right, okay. We know, for example, that a stressed mother, a human a mouse mother is the experiment, a stressed mouse will have stressed children. And that those children will have stressed children. Because we select for architectures that then become our genetics. If these, if the selective pressure is maintained over sufficient periods of time. Hmm. And that's what happens within a cancer, within a tumor. Here you have all these different metabolic states. So this cancer is screwed up, you know, and then right. you're treating, screwing it up even more and you have different ones that can survive and they survive and then they 
undergo enhanced mutagenesis in the areas that allowed them to survive. So they're just becoming more and more vicious and diverse. Wow. When you right. look at a cancer, you've got a genetic catastrophe where you've got 50 different mutations. You've got 50 different cancers. Well, guess what? You made that. Wow. Because you put on it an assault that allowed for those selections, which is why chemo and radiation most of the, I, so I told you that out of these people who've treated thousands of people with an 80% survival rate, most of the failures, and they all say this, universally, independently, uncoached, are those who've had chemo or radiation. Wow. And then there's scientific papers that say why, and I'm giving you a very simple, easy to understand wow. explanation as to what's going on, and the doctors are not interested in hearing what I have to say. They will not let me speak at the university where I used to be a professor wow. here at UVM. Really? I've gone on numerous occasions, spoken to critical people who know what I know and who, in some cases, I worked with for 30 years. You know, they know what I'm able to do. Wow. <laughs> they know me well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I had the first patent in 1985 on sequencing DNA by synthesis. That's how we do it today. You know, my method didn't become commercially available until 2005, and I discovered it in 85. Wow. <laughs> so, you know, I, I have the ability to see things right. you know, in a functional way, and that's what this thermodynamics story has done. And as a consequence of understanding life, I can understand how we have to manipulate flow for desired outcomes, like, for example, getting rid of cancer. Wow. And anti-aging. Again, I'm 69 years old, you know? Right. Yeah, no, <laughs> start, you definitely don't look it. I start the day with 100 milligrams of oil. <laughs> wow, 100 milligrams, okay. You know, and I do that again at least once once during the day. Wow. You know, and I've used cannabis for 53 years. And I've got all sorts of nasty genetics that would be problematic for me. And are problematic for me. But I'm able to minimize them and regulate the inflammatory-based crap that is my unfortunate nature. You know, I'm HLA-B27 that predisposes you to what's called ankylosing spondylitis, which is arthritis of the spine and psoriasis, oh, wow. and I'm positive for the RH factor. So, you know, I've gone through huge, horrible bouts where every joint in my body, except for the one I was smoking, was in pain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've had heart failure, I've gone wow. through all sorts of different things, and I apply my science. So here I am, feeling fine. Wow. <laughs> As are many other people who are listening to me. Right. You know, it has nothing to do with me. It has to do with science, and I've just been fortunate enough to figure something out. So all I do is share it, and I don't bother dealing with the doctors and the scientists anymore. I've got about 90 videos out there that explain the things that I'm explaining to you. Right. And there are, you know literally thousands of people now around the world who've started to watch these things and to see that there might be some alternatives. That's great. Well, one thing I'm unclear on is um, a lot of the research I've read says that, for instance, THC acts only on the CB1 receptors and it says CBD acts on the, the CB2 receptors. Is, is that accurate or is that a, a bad generalization? No, no. First of all, CB1 works on both. I mean, THC works on both. Okay. CBD works on neither. Right. Okay. It's not a direct analog for any... Right. Either of them. But it, well, it seems CBD does bind to a site on CB1, which inhibits CB1 activity. Okay. So what I, my current thinking, and, and, you know, we've only spoken about two receptors. There are many other receptors. Right. And only two cannabinoids as well part of these these metabolic pathways that are all flowing, you know, in this dynamic uh, harmony here. And there are many different endocannabinoids, as you point out. A critical thing for everybody to keep in mind is that how do we make endocannabinoids? We make them out of unsaturated fatty acids. So here we have physicians saying marijuana is no good. We, we don't have enough studies on one hand, and then they turn their head and they say, oh, yeah, everybody should be using fish oil and polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acids. Well, what is that? what's going on here? Number one, we make endocannabinoids out of those omega-3 fatty acids. 
Right. Oops. Body makes pot out of them. You just dropped out. I'm sorry. So I said your your body makes pot out of fish oil. Right. Out of <laughs> trees. That's why it's good for you. And the doctors don't even understand that. So they're telling you take fish oil, but no, stay away from cannabis. Well, they happen to work the same way. That's why they're both good for you. You know, <laughs> right? And is it only in the neurons where the cannabinoids are uh, synthesized from the cell membrane, or is it all no, over? The body? Okay. Your CD one receptor is pretty much everywhere because we are differentiated beings. Which let all right? There's another good part here. Now we haven't talked about stem cells. Okay. Stem cells are stem-like, meaning they don't age so that they can be differentiated at other times in our life. Guess what they burn for fuel? Fat. Fat, okay. That's why they don't age. Right. Because they're not exposing themselves to all this extra free radical production. Right. right. And they have CB2 receptors on them. So when you're in a fat-burning mode, that allows the stem cells to expand and remain as stem cells, okay. all right? But if you have CB1 activation on the stem cells, now they can burn energy efficiently and become something. Oh, wow, okay. All right, so we know that cannabis promotes neurogenesis, the generation of new neurons. Well, how does it do it? CB2 expands the precursor cells, CB1 differentiates them. Wow. All right, that's how we make our blood, so we make our bones, everything in our body we replace via stem cells. And it's literally controlled by cannabinoids. According wow. to me, it is just controlled by nutrition. Right. See, everything right. is controlled by the fuel. Cannabis simply regulates the fuels. Wow. Which is why if you go on a ketogenic diet where you're burning fat, it's very, very healthy for you. It'll minimize a lot of our age-related illnesses, people with arthritis and all this stuff. Get on the on altered diets. Use that as the number one approach. You are what you eat. That's real. Mm -hmm. What else do you think you made yourself out of? But what about these uh, high-carb, low-fat diets and uh, veganism, which is mostly carbohydrates and very little fats? But in the case of vegans, you're eating typically low levels, so you're already calorically restricting, okay, which means okay. you're turning on fat burning. You right. see, when people are calorically restricted, they turn on that recycling. You, you know, it's interesting, and, and this is a kind of a speculative observation, pseudo-observation. You know, you see a lot of these old, old people uh, who survived concentration camps. Well, they underwent so much self-purification via that <laughs> long-term starvation that they got rid of their precancer cells and other things that would be detrimental. So caloric restriction is very, very important. You know, the Seventh-day Adventists who are uh, vegetarians along the lines of what you say, but they're also thin. They don't eat tons of stuff. So they stay in a fat-burning mode. Whereas if you're going to eat more you got to have an appropriate balance. And even things like the meats we used to eat, a hundred years ago, uh, th they were free-ranging. Mm, Grass-fed. So the food that they ate was much higher in omega-3s and held the meat and the milk was much higher in omega-3s. Now, omega-3s and omega-6s are both essential fatty acids. We need them. We can't make them. But omega-6s have the ability to be either anti or pro-inflammatory, depending on their circuitry. Okay. For example, aspirin and, and uh, you know, th these various anti-inflammatory drugs, what they do is they shut down what's called the COX pathway, cyclooxygenase pathways. Aspirin does it, for example. Okay. And what that does is it shuts down some of the pro-inflammatory biochemistry that can occur from omega-6s, what's known as the arachidonic cascade. All right. Okay. That's also how we make anandamide, one of our main endocannabinoids. So everything in life is always a balance. And our institutionalized balance of ourselves is a product of our lives, our genetics, our food, everything, you know. <laughs> and our illnesses come from that as well as our health. And that's why modulating flow, in particular reducing 
carbohydrate consumption, promoting efficient and uh, see polyunsaturated fats are really good for you because you know what they do? Mm -mm. They turn on fat burning. <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> That's why they're good for you. And all the saturated fats that people are concerned about that are clogging the arteries and clogging the arteries in their brain and helping facilitate the deposition of amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's. And no matter where you go, it's the same story, all right? It's all inflammation-free radical-based. Wow. All of those things are minimized when you turn on fat burning because then you're recycling all of those things. You're not, you're not going to put fat in your arteries if you're burning fat. The fat that you put in your arteries, you make out of your carbohydrates. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's fucking idiots that have been putting people, oh, fat-free <laughs> diet, fat-free diets. Reduce That's your cholesterol. Causing yeah. The autism and the cancer and all of these diseases are being caused by the fact that advertisements are not generated for your health. They are generated for money. And people, in their ignorance, absorb that nonsense and then go and do the wrong things and kill themselves. Right. Hold on just one, one second. I'm sorry. Sure. Go ahead. Sure. Um, I'm not sure. Maybe 20, 20 minutes? Sorry about that. My wife just got home. We might have to wrap it up soon because i got to start dinner. It's nighttime here. But this is extremely interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, definitely before we go though I, I wanted to get an introduction from you uh, just huh. if you could just tell us a bit about who you are and a bit about your background because yeah let me let me finish one important piece here first okay go ahead having to do with this fat burning and, and, and on our diets you make fat saturated fat out of carbohydrates why because then you're not burning them and making free radicals okay okay so whenever you see fat on somebody, it's because their cells said, I don't want to burn any more sugar. I'm going to make some fat to save my life. Wow. Okay. <laughs> now look at the consequences of that. What's the number one killer today in the United States is heart disease and metabolic syndrome and, you know, diabetes, et cetera. Okay. All right. Well, what is diabetes? You have two types, insulin resistant, insulin dependent, right? Your pancreas makes insulin in response to sugar levels in your blood. Mm -hmm. Because too much sugar in your blood has physiological activity. It's osmotically active and it's not healthy for your cells. They have to be in a proper osmotic environment, okay? Mm -hmm. So when there's too much sugar, the pancreas senses that and then starts to make, after calcium stimulation, etc., and free radical production, it starts to make insulin, which then goes out into the blood and goes to the insulin receptor on cells. But now if these cells have been burning too many sugars, they don't want to burn any more sugar. Right. Internal homeostatic mechanisms shut down the transport of sugar into the cell and prevent it from being burned. So what do you now have? A bunch of sugar. <laughs> Insulin-resistant diabetes. Wow. It's your cells trying to survive and you're trying to kill them. Wow. What do you need to do? Go on a ketogenic diet, eliminate your diabetes, literally. I have two friends, both severely overweight, both diabetic. They were insulin dependent diabetics, okay? And now they are on ketogenic diets and using at least 200 milligrams a day of cannabis. They don't take any insulin for half a year now. They lose significant amounts of weight, 120 pounds, the other 60 pounds. Their sugar levels are normal. Wow. No yes. insulin, okay? No insulin. Wow. <laughs> what kind of oil are they using for that? Is it just raw cannabis oil? THC oil, not hemp seed oil, but you right. know, THC, high THC oil, so Rick like Simpson Rick oil. Rick Simpson oil, okay. Yeah, wow. exactly. Yeah. We need to consume that every day, modern man. You see, I started down this path before. Historically, we died from infectious diseases and we used our inflammatory responses to control them. Today, we are dying from those inflammatory responses. The number one killer is no longer infectious diseases. It's age-related diseases that all have as their ideological foundation free radicals and carbohydrate burn. 
So we've shifted our diets. We've shifted the diets of the animals we've eaten. We eat. We need to shift back to more omega threes, increase our cannabinoid activity, and that we already know. Look at how insane this is. This is you'll like this too. I got to. What the federal United States government does is it denies all of the science that it paid for. Marijuana has no medical value. All right. So they maintain now this separation between the federal government and the state. The states are allowed to do their own marijuana laws to manifest true democracy and the will of the people. The feds say, no, you can only do that within your state because this is bad. You know, we want you to be like those mice to die early and to shiver in fear. <laughs> Idiots. <laughs> so uh, where was I going with this? Uh, where was I going? Where was I going? You got to give me a hint. You, oh man, let me think. You're talking about modern man must consume these. Yeah, these modern man. Thank you. So, because of our improved diets, even though we eat shitty food in most cases, and because of the, the year round availability, and because of vitamins, and because of public health, and because of antibiotics, which are good drugs most of the time, or can be, as long as you're not feeding them to animals to get them fat, uh, all of these things have created the age-related illnesses that are a function of our imbalance. So again, if you, if you want to inhibit heart disease, burn fat. If you want to inhibit diabetes, burn hmm. fat. But it also extends into the realm of infectious diseases. As I mentioned to you earlier, viral infections have to modulate free radical production in a way that the cell doesn't die when it's turned into a virus factory. All right, so they have these viral infectivity factors that typically ultimately wind up regulating free radical production. All right, wow. now all of these viruses like HIV have learned and evolved in the sugar burning mode. So when you force them into fat burning, the same way as you force a cancer cell that can't make the trip, <laughs> wow. HIV goes away as well. Wow, so I've got one friend. Who's been? Uh, he's an HIV activist who've had HIV for about 26 years, and when I met him five or six years ago, he was fully drug resistant to, to all of the existing protocols. We were in Washington D.C. We were lobbying in the Congress for a uh, new biotech bills to get more HIV drugs, right. and he came out with a Carposi sarcoma, which is like it's a skin cancer looking, but it's actually a, a blood vessel cancer. It's caused by herpes. Oh and, wow. And that's what people with HIV die from in the day when they had all the purple blotches. Those purple blotches were Carposis, okay? So this guy comes down with a Carposi. I say, David, put this cream on it. And I have oil because I get high all the time. He puts it on. I go back to New York. I mean, he goes back to New York. I go back to Colorado. I was still there. And three days later, I get a phone call. He goes, Bob, what the fuck is going on here? I'm holding a Carposi in my hand. They're not supposed to fall off. <laughs> wow. <laughs> And every time he'd get a new one, we'd put the oil on it, and very painfully they would fall off. I said, David, if you don't start consuming large quantities, you're going to die because you'll get it in your internal organs. And that's how people die from carposis. Right. So he starts eating it, and he's been doing this now for these numbers of years. He went from having full-blown HIV, viral load of millions, to undetectable viral load, even with a spinal tap. Wow. He has normal T-cell counts, although a lot of them are anergic, whereas he was at 36 when he had full-blown HIV. The dyslipidemia on his back and his stomach is gone. You can't deposit fat if you burn fat. It's that simple. Wow. <laughs> That's why you get rid of your heart disease for the same reason. Hmm. You so got to understand what life is if you want to treat health. And doctors don't know what life is. Right, yeah, they just know what they're taught at medical school by the yeah, pharmaceuticals. Would you, would, you, would you bring your car to a mechanic who didn't know how a car worked? No, definitely And yet not. we go to these doctors, we pay them high amounts, we bow down to them in their white coats and their knowledge, and they don't know what the hell they're doing <laughs> other than making money and killing people. Yeah, well. They're great for emergency treatment. Right. You know, broken bones, things like that. I happen to be on a pharmaceutical that is keeping me healthy because I have AFib and we've not been able to control it with anything else. So there is a place for them. 
but it's the last place, not the first place. Yeah, I'd agree with that wholeheartedly. Uh, can I ask how how does um, cannabis, the full cannabis oil, stimulate CB two and turn on fat burning? Because what you usually hear is um, stoners get the munchies and eat a lot and get fat. But what you're telling me is that when you use it as a food, is that correct? No, let me let me go a little further here. Stoners, when you're smoking in particular, you're bringing it right into your brain and you get stoned. But that doesn't mean it's not affecting your whole body as well. Okay, even if it's not doing it in an optimal way. See, when you eat it, it's not going right into your brain. You'll get you eat too much and you're going to get really stoned. But along with getting really stoned, you know what you get? Very hot. Okay. Because you're turning on fat burning. Right. Right. And even without taking the extremes that do that, you're still subtly shifting balances. So that from an epidemiological point of view, what we know about cannabis users is that they have a thinner waist than non-users because they burn more fat, you see. We also know that they have lower levels of diabetes. Why? Because they burn more fat. We also know that they have lower levels of bladder cancer, which now leads me to a very important thing that I'm glad we got to before we end here. And that is what they, and I started down this path as well. In the United States, by creating this two system, they've created a wonderful epidemiological experiment. So I got to back up a second and tell you about blips and flips. Hmm. Blip stands for backward looking people who are cannabinoid deficient, more primitive people. They're the caveman of modern man. They run the world. That's why the world is run by aggression and stupidity and greed instead of cooperativity. And it's not a function of capitalism. It's a function of the capitalists. Capitalism reproduces evolutionary selective pressures. But instead of having it for the good of man, we have it for the greed of individuals. So that's, that's what's got to shift there. Now, I got diverted here. So blips and flips. Blips and flips, yes. So uh, the more aggressive people are naturally the ones who are going to rule others because they want to control them. And those are the cannabis deficient people because they live in fear and paranoia about change because they don't make enough pot to embrace change. All change, good or bad, from a chemical, biochemical point of view is stress, mm -hmm. period. You have to readjust the biochemistry. And that echoes through the complexity of the system up into your mind stress, all right? So what we want to do is we want to minimize stress and that's, again, why the endocannabinoid system has constantly increased because it's, it's that fresh stress that leads to all of our illnesses. That's hmm. it's the biochemical stress. But on a mental level, what we have seen is this continuous increase in endocannabinoid activity from an evolutionary point of view, which means we keep changing in that direction. And right now, who is going to who's going to want to control somebody else other than somebody who's fearful right that they're going to be some harm people who live in cooperativity and harmony they don't have fear <laughs> of one another you see so it's this fearful group that dominates the world it's this fearful group that makes all the rules and regulations and you know marijuana we need more testing and blah 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 and it's also people who are able to adjust to that linear thinking of rules and that rule the world that succeed. They are the people who become the doctors. Right. You see? So they're already deviated into, the, into following orders, basically. And the orders that they've been given have been given by their education system, which is provided by the pharmaceutical industry. Right. So most doctors are organically in the right place for themselves. And that's why they don't want to hear anything that I'm talking about because it totally destroys the world they live in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, completely. And European doctors are better and German doctors are better. They have more holistic attitudes and more herbal approaches to things. The United States is just, you know, the chemical industry of the world in yeah. terms of pharmaceuticals. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Uh, that I lived outside of the U.S. for most of my adult life, but every time I go back to visit and you watch TV, you don't get advertisements for uh, antidepressants anywhere outside of um, the United States, and it just blows my mind whenever I see it. Like, do you have sad thoughts? Do you do this? Ask your doctor to prescribe you whatever. So yeah, just blows well, my mind. You know, again, 
and depression is when you don't have enough cannabinoid activity. I mean, think about what in, in, when you take a couple of hits and you feel better, you get high. Cannabis is classified as a euphoric. Well, what kind of moronic, insane government would outlaw a euphoric? <laughs> don't want your people to be happy? You want to make it illegal for people to be happy? But it's even worse than that because you know what? Psychoactive cannabinoids are in mother's milk. Oh, wow. So – First thing any mammal mother does, and mammals have mammal gra mammary glands because that's how they better take care of their children. <laughs> so nature has selected for us to best take care of our children by the first thing we do when we get them out of us inside is to get them stoned. <laughs> now, this is insanity that we've outlawed that. So one of the jokes I give on my talks all the time is, should we arrest nursing mothers? <laughs> or should we just arrest all with paraphernalia? Oops, I'm sorry, you dropped out there. Should we arrest nursing mothers? Could you repeat that? Yeah, should we arrest nursing mothers for giving their kids psychoactive cannabinoids? Or should we just simply arrest all women for walking around with paraphernalia? <laughs> That's pretty awesome. Now, uh, related, this milk story is actually very interesting as well. Because 6,000 years ago or something in that range, I don't know, the, you know, it's approximately 6,000 years ago, adult humans could not drink milk because we shut down those pathways. We can do it when we were a child, and then we shut it down, right? right? But then we developed farming and agriculture and dairy. And we made, because we didn't have refrigeration, we made yogurts and cheeses, which mm. digest some of the lactic acid, uh, lactic, lactic sugar, rather, lactate. Um, so at that point, people started to benefit from the nutritional value, but that nutritional value included psychoactive cannabinoids. Because remember, number one, the animals were eating outside regularly. Mm -hmm. People were growing cannabis as well in some places. So they, you know, because of full food, fiber, and fuel medicine, <laughs> it was thought to be first cultivated 10,000 years ago by the pygmies as the man's first agricultural crop. You know, right. and we know from religious burials that, you know, it was it was all over the world in ancient history. So people were eating it. They were not eating FDA approved, you know, no THC, special seed hemp bullshit. You know, <laughs> they were getting cannabis just the way in China. Now, there's a, there's a village in China where people live the longest in the, on the planet mm -hmm. and their main source of food is hemp. Wow. So they're eating hemp seeds and, you know, all the hemp products there. So, you know, once again, we can increase our longevity and our health by using more cannabis, which is what has happened internally and which we can now be smart enough to do and take, take control of the situation here and be amazing. like the more evolutionarily advanced people, the forward-looking people, as opposed to the backward-looking people. So the oppressors are cannabinoid deficient. <laughs> I, I would believe as well, uh, this was a study I'd love to see. I'd like to, uh, to look at the political persuasion of legislators around the world and, and see which ones were breastfed or not. Oh, wow. That's interesting. You see, because, well, because you see, the reason that this evolved is because childbirth is a stressful event. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're going through potentially low oxygen. Your head is crumpled. You're getting all these, you know, squeezes. You're getting all the fear hormones, et cetera, from the mother. You know, you need to get stoned on birth because what that does is it relieves post-birth traumatic stress disorder. Wow. And probably Carmine. helps you to forget, too. Yeah, well, that's all part of why you – you see, look, if, well. if you can't forget and somebody does something to you, you never forgive them. The more you forget, the more you forgive, which is another reason why – Cooperation is what has got us here, and yet somehow our governments and our leadership, they don't participate in cooperation right. internationally or within themselves. So our whole social structure needs to re-evolve into a more cannabinoid-endowed level of cooperativity and embracing change for the good of all. Right, yeah, Cooperati cooperation as opposed to competition. But the, Yeah, so we're back again to this milk story. Hmm. In that 6,000-year period, Europeans and Northern Africans redeveloped the ability to 
use milk as adults. Well, and this yeah. part of what shows this whole plasticity that I was talking about, how we go from metabolism to epigenetics to genetics. In 6,000 years, we now became milk drinkers. And it, I'm sure that the fact that we were taking full fat milk loaded with endocannabinoids from properly fed animals was contributing to man's own advancement. You know, the use of psychedelic drugs and cannabis in general help promote awakening as it does for all of us, you know, continuously. But by taking it in your food like that, you're shifting the balances. Which well, takes me back to another thing that, that I didn't finish. And that is <laughs> going back to the fact that the feds have created this partition. The backward looking people will continue to use the federal system they will continue to poison themselves at as they maintain welfare for the doctors and the hospital and the pharmaceutical industry, all right, through the ignorance of the people. But the people who are more cannabinoid endowed and more likely to try new things are the people who are more likely to use <laughs> cannabis to begin with. So they will now go to the state system. We already have results of this in the United States. In Colorado, $120 million was saved by the federal government because people were not taking advantage of their federal Medicaid, Medicare system. Instead, they were taking money out of their pocket to use medicine that worked. Hmm. Now, there's well. consequences to this. The consequence is that over the next few years, you're going to see more of the things that I just described to you in terms of diabetes and heart disease and cancer and everything else. You're going to see that the people who do the federal system are dying. It's costing them a lot of money. They're unhealthy and unhappy. And you can see the stoners who are the people of the future, the forward looking people that become the future man. See, the, the backward looking people today were in the past, the forward looking people. <laughs> But that's how forward we were, is that we look at them today and we view them as the cavemen that they are. <laughs> Those of us who have, you know, a more enlightened attitude. Right. You know, we don't want to kill them. We want them to just, just leave us alone. Think of the attitude. Think of the sickness of the mind that says, I don't like this plant. I don't like that you're smoking this plant or eating this plant. I don't like that you're, it's making you feel happy. I don't like that <laughs> you're curing your cancer and your arthritis. And I don't like it so much that I'm going to take you away from your family and friends and I'm going to put you in jail. This is fucking mental illness. Yeah, definitely. Period. Yeah, Wake it's pretty up, blatant. world. And that is waking up. We are having the cannabis awakening so that the endocannabinoid level of the human population is increasing enough that we're going to have a phase change in the global consciousness of man. And that's going to go hand in hand with the bigger change in our chemistry set, the planet itself. Right now, you're seeing fluctuations of all of the variables that are part of our system. Our weather change, our El Nino changes, our fluctuation of migration patterns, including humans going into Germany and other places. <laughs> Our financial systems, boom-bust cycles, up and down, the stock market going crazy, right? Everywhere you look, humanity is fluctuating beyond our normal level. That's what happens when you have a far from equilibrium phase change. That's that energy wow. that I said has to manifest itself as something new. That's how vertebrates came about. That's how humans came about. And right now, the whole planet is undergoing a change. And if we're going to survive, the humans that will be the future humans will be the more cannabinoid endowed, just like has always happened in the past. The will of God, generalized open system dynamics, G-O-D, <laughs> the physics of life. <laughs> Wow, that's pretty pretty mind blowing. I hope I've entertained you a little <laughs> bit. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> no, that's very cool. So obviously, I'm totally insane. I've used way too much marijuana. <laughs> and yeah. I keep institutionalized. <laughs> yes, can't we all? I guess. Well, that's uh. We are all institutionalized, but now we got to get rid of the, the you know the uh, the jailers. We yeah. need free. We need biochemical freedom, mental freedom that goes with it so that we can have an evolving planet of sustainability and survival. Yeah, I agree. Amen to that. That's for sure.
Well, there's new technology coming on board that's going to give man the ability to have clean energy. And Germany is on the forefront of some of these things that are going on. I can't talk about them, though. Okay. All right. Very nice. But I'm just getting – because, kind of, you know, potheads are optimists. That's our nature, right? Well, you know, that's actually what got me into the whole cannabis field was I was looking into uh, supercapacitors and graphene. And I, uh-huh, I read yes. an article that – and now I'm working with gentlemen who have created uh, hemp carbon supercapacitors that so are cool. just unbelievable. I mean, literally – they're eight times the storage density of current um, rare earth metal batteries. They can be recharged basically unlimited numbers of times. They can be charged instantly. If the power is available and you plug it in, boom, it's instantly charged. They showed me video where they were, they were running the battery hooked up to a voltage meter, and they drove a metal spike through the battery, and the voltage meter just went down Oops. by the number of cells that were damaged by the spike. Nothing else happened. <laughs> And Do you then, have any literature on that that's public that I could have? It's not public yet, but through the Canopedia, okay. we, we want to publish some of that. But I can put you in touch with the guys doing this. And Well, you see, the reason I bring it up is because my friend is the smartest person on the planet, and he's the one who's invented all of these various things, like the engine in the space shuttle. Oh, he wow. did the preliminary design of the stealth bomber. Wow. You know, he made the battery in your cell phone. And, and he's very into all of these kinds of. He's a fucking guy. He's a combination of Tesla and Da Vinci. He's oh, brilliant. Wow. Awesome. Album. So yep. there, there are new things coming aboard. So all of us cannabis-looking people should know that there's a future ahead that's already available and is starting to initiate for a clean, healthy world. That's awesome. Yeah, that's what I believe, and that's what it's I've happening. seen. I know it's happening. That's awesome. Windmills in Germany are just a little piece, the tip of an iceberg. Yeah. Germany wisely is ending all coal and all nuclear for alternatives that are now coming on board. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's where I'm living at the moment. But I'm moving. I know. So Deutschland much. über alles. My mom was a Münchener, so I'm very oh, nice. familiar with German and German history. As a matter of fact, I owe my life to Adolf Hitler because my father was a soldier in the war and my mother was a Fräulein and out popped me. Oh, wow. <laughs> very cool. <laughs> and Let's... I'm born on December 7th, day of infamy. Oh, wow. Well, I, I'm going to have to end it soon because i got to start uh, working on dinner sure, with my wife. But before we go, you if enjoy. I can just... Hope, uh... Go ahead. Uh, we can do whatever you want, whenever you want. You know, I'm available. This is what I do because I'm into spreading this information. This is the most important thing I think I can do is have people evaluate what I say. Show me that I'm wrong or accept that I'm right. Uh, you know, whatever it is. I know what it is. Right. <laughs> Okay. We, we, we can do this again sometime where I can give you graphs and I can elaborate on some of the chemistry. We could, we could use this one as a, uh, you know, kind of as a, a big overview, and then we could do some specific things so people can really start to see what I mean by these flow-dependent structures and can see various impacts. Uh, are you on my Facebook page at all? No, I don't think I am. Let me check. Yeah, because I'm, I'm saturated, but you know, I can add people once in a while. Because I have a lot of discussions on there that I think would be very relevant. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see you there. So I'll send you a friend request. Uh, yeah, and I also you've reached the limit, so I can't. Yeah, yeah, but once in a while somebody empties, and then and then I can put you in. Okay, I'll just send you my a link to my profile, so you can add me. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Yeah. Well, um, then I won't record an intro. And um, oh, we can do that too if you want, or whenever you want. Okay, yeah. If you just want to tell tell us a bit about uh, your history and your background and why you're qualified to have these thoughts, not just a man laying on the couch. I'm actually not on the couch. I'm on the floor. I lay on the floor. <laughs> I live on the floor. I live in squalor. You see, I'm totally disorganized. All I do is lay around, read science, while I'm ADD and I watch TV as well. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> While I'm stoned, of course. So, so what qualifies you to have these opinions? Right, and why so people listen? I, I have a PhD. I have a PhD in molecular genetics and biochemistry from the City University of New York. Wow. Uh, I became an asso- assistant research professor at New York Medical College, and then at the uh, University of Vermont, and then I became chairman of the biology department at the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. And that was 2001, and by 2002. I started teaching the world's only course on endocannabinoids and medical marijuana and uh, educated a lot of people. I taught courses on aging, 
on immunology, on microbiology, on DNA repair, and on endocannabinoids and medical marijuana. And they all unified because all life unifies under these things that I've been, this physics that I've been explaining, far from equilibrium thermodynamics. So, you know, I, I, the concepts that I present were, came out of my classes to a degree because I teach my classes uh, when I taught abnormally. I didn't give them exams. Okay. I wanted the class to be an enjoyable learning experience because that's what it naturally should be because knowledge moves you further from equilibrium. Right. And if we can't enjoy learning, then we're doing something wrong. So my classes all began with a few weeks of introduction to this physics that I presented here today. And then what my students had to do is they get credit for coming to class, they get credit for asking me questions, and they get credit for answering my questions. And at the end of the year in my advanced classes, they would have to tell me what grade they deserved and why, and they would write one page, and I would give them whatever grade they, des they told me they deserved. Wow. Because that reflected their honesty and their learning. It worked out very well. They loved the class and they did well and they learned more than they'd said in any other class they ever had. Wow, that's pretty awesome. That's revolutionary in itself. Sorry, just one <laughs> second. Sorry. No, it'll be just another two more minutes. Okay. okay. Yeah, maybe we can wrap it up there because uh, I'm yeah. going to have to renew this review this video and just get my head around some of the concepts that you've presented. Yeah, there's a lot there. <laughs> it will eventually penetrate you because it is real and, and stoners always find it to be such. Right. You know, it's why we can cure cancer. That's why it's an anti-aging drug. It's why the world needs it. And it's why the cannabis awakening is spreading around the world now. Enough people know. And that's the tipping point then. And then bang, phase change, new world order. That's Not awesome. the one they thought. Yeah. Power to the people. Let's do it. Well, that's what the Canop Canopedia's mission is. We just want to get it out to as many people as possible. So Yeah, well, that's fine. I'll give you as much shit as you want. <laughs> i got many videos out there, so you know you can learn from what's out there. Okay. And you can use pieces of them. To feel free. You know, you want to compose things, whatever you want. All right. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Bob. All right. Take care, buddy. Be you have well. a great day. Bye. Yes, sir. Bye-bye.